Um, I have in the room Frances Delvois, who, was the, who is the wife of my husband's boss, former boss in London, England, and she's promised not to leap out of her seat and say, I don't remember it like that. <laughs> a lot of people say, oh, you know, the wife of a diplomat, oh, that poor thing, what a suffering life she must have, all those parties and big houses and servants and blah, blah, blah. But I'm here to tell you that there's actually a dark underbelly to the life. I hope, I hope uh, Francis will agree with me. Um, we joined in the 60s, and when I say we, it was really we. John needed permission, my husband John needed permission to marry me. Um, unfortunately, we had already made all the wedding plans, so we just went ahead and got married. Um, and about a year later, I just hoped that there were no skeletons that clattered out of my closet while the RCMP was examining me, but apparently not, and, and a year later, we got permission. A year and a half later, we got permission to get married, and by then we had one child, so it was just as well. <laughs> those were the, the sort of kumbaya days. I don't know if you can remember, but in those days, everybody kept saying, what are you into? What are you into? Nowadays, everybody says, what are you reading? But in those days, they said, what are you into? And I mean, the answer was supposed to be macrame, I think, mostly. <laughs> and I never got into anything, because I'd been a hostess at Expo, and then I had worked at IBM, and then I suddenly moved to what was then rinky-dink Ottawa, and I wasn't into anything, and I felt really inadequate. And suddenly, people started to say to me, what is your life's theme? And I thought, God, I never got into anything, and now I'm supposed to have a life's theme. <laughs> so, and I was shyer than I am now. Um, and so what, very early on in our career, we were invited, and you see, I say our career. It's funny, I think we always say our career, because we somehow, Join, join together, we were a team. Very early on, um, in the first year, we were invited to an ambassador's residence in Ottawa, a very large embassy, a Western embassy. And you know, I was all at Twitter. And, but when I got there, I, was, I just hoped that nobody was going to talk to me because I had no idea what I would talk about. So I, I positioned myself in the farthest corner of the dining room. It was all empty. In the, in the farthest corner and stood there by myself. And the house was designed with, for some unknown reason, it had a staircase on one far end and then it had a reception room, a large entry hall, and then this dining room that I was in. And the uh, ambassador's wife came down late and she apparently had issues, quote, unquote. And she came down late and made a grand entrance in a beautiful black sheath with her chignon, white chignon piled up and a white sort of a, I've never forgotten it, that's why I can describe it. <laughs> and a white panel with flowing things out the back. So she made a real spectacle as she came down the stairs with these panels behind her. And she went across the first room, across the foyer, came into the dining room, all with her arms outstretched like this. And I stood and I looking to see who it was that she was going to embrace when she embraced me. And she gave me a great big hug and then she stuck her arms out and she said, who the hell are you? <laughs> and I realized then that, it, you know, we joined the department, but somewhere or other there had better be a me in this because who the hell was I? So I think I spent a lot of my life trying to fashion a me out of the, out of the we. When, as soon as we joined, we got a little handbook that told you everything, you know, about gloves and about where to fold your calling card and, and the fact that you had to appear within three days at the wife of the ambassadors in your regalia and, and all that sort of thing. And we got a very small loan and we were to go out and buy dishes and, and uh, entertaining things. And they said you had, had to buy 12 of everything and 18 dinner plates. Uh, in case you had a buffet, which was really quite something. And I guess if you're a younger person now, you're probably wondering why. But anyway, in those days, that's what, that's what we did. And I rushed to Ogilvy's with, with uh, my little list and chose all the things. And the woman there, the young woman there, said, I don't get it. Why are you buying all this stuff? And I said, well, we're we're moving in that then we knew we were going to Nigeria I said we're moving to Africa and she said oh I had no idea that there were rules about that well what are you going for what are you going to do and I said my husband's going to be a diplomat 
And she said, well, what are you going to do? And I didn't think so. I said, entertain. And she said, singer or dancer? <laughs> that was, appendage was more like it. We were expected to serve the, the wife of the head of mission, the wife of the ambassador. So our first ambassador's wife used to call and say, oh, Elena, there's something really boring on, but Alan and I have bought four tickets, and we hope you'll take friends and enjoy. The second ambassador's wife would say, Mrs. Schramm, I need you to be present at the meeting of the Red Cross next Saturday. The upshot was that, of course, we never answered the phone because we didn't want to get sent out. We were also told that um, you had to, unless you were entertaining in your own home, you had to be available to, to attend the ambassador's dinner if he suddenly invited you. You sort of had to be in the closet in the right gear, and if he said, no, one, one person is short, you left out of the closet, you know, in your black tie and tiara or whatever, you know, to help out. And um, that, that was quite difficult, too, because, you know, you never really knew what you were going to be faced with. One night, the ambassador had invited all military, senior military people in the Philippines, and their wives didn't come, so the table was set for 20, and it was man, gap, man, gap, man, gap. And I said, oh, what a pity, because a friend of mine is the goddaughter of the head of, of the military, and she was just over this afternoon, if I'd only known, and he said, go get her. And so they sent the official car for me with the driver, and I went in an evening gown to the cinema, which is where she was, with a flashlight up and down the aisle <laughs> saying, Rika, Rika, and Rika never came. So it was all the different things that we, we were also included in our husband's appraisal. Um, they would say, you know, ably assisted by his delightful wife or something like that. I never knew what happened. There was a wife who locked her husband in the bathroom. He was a philandering husband, and she locked him in the bathroom, and he had to shimmy down the, um, the eaves trough, I think, to get to a meeting. I'm just never quite sure what her, what the appraisal must have said. <laughs> but it's all different now. Anybody here that's young enough and wants to join the Foreign Service, it's all different now. Wives do nothing. Uh, that they don't want to do. Spouses, spouses. In my day, it was always the, the boy was the diplomat and the girl was the, was the assistant. Um, when I was asked to give the speech to the new um, ambassador spouses going overseas, and the first thing they said was, do not mention responsibilities of any kind, because last year we had a very militant group and we had to call the head of personnel down to quieten them down because they said, we are not getting paid, we are not doing anything for the Canadian government. And that's how it is now, and I suppose that's how it should be. Um, very often, in, in our day, when you know, if the ambassador said, could you host a small function for whatever, you said, of course. Nowadays, we've discovered the young people will either say, uh, my wife doesn't feel like it, or my spouse doesn't feel like it, or they'll say, we don't have matching dishes, or they'll say, I'm sorry, Taylor's got football that night, and I'm not doing anything, you know. So it's all, it's all changed. Um, so we went to Lagos, Nigeria, in 71, soon after the Biafran War. And uh, while my friends were all getting ahead and making a mark for themselves, I was serving tea in white gloves. I was 23, and uh, it was the time when I was still cooking dinner at 3 o'clock in the afternoon because we hadn't been married that long, and I figured if I cooked dinner at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, if it went wrong, I could, you know, recook it. <laughs> I could make another <laughs> meal. And I always, I cooked dinner at 3, and then I had a shower at 5, and I put on a little frock, and I put on a little velvet ribbon in my hair so that I would be perfect, you see, because those were the days. My son-in-law keeps telling my daughter that she needs to do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd become an appendage suddenly. I had no pay, no pension, no upward mobility. Luckily, um, as Lisa said, I, was, I somehow managed to work. It, it wasn't very common, I don't think, in those days, and we always had to get permission. Uh, but I taught at the international school. I taught writing. I taught English as a second language. I wrote for UN and international NGOs, and in South Africa I had the best job at the whole embassy. I ran a large political fund. But you know, moving like that means that every two to four years your children are completely uprooted. Um, and 
they've got to, whereas we look for people that are like-minded and we seek out the people that, that most represent our views and our values, they're thrown into a school that where they have no choice. Our, we always put our children in local schools rather than the international. We wanted them to really integrate into the local community and get some value out of the posting. So they were in Nigerian schools, Filipino schools, English schools, um, South African schools before they went home. And it served them well because they all skipped a couple of grades when they got home. But it was always a disruption until Christmas. And we always say to people, you won't feel at home until until December or January. And one of the courses that we take prior to going overseas is what on, you know, the cultural shock that you'll find. Worst of all things was in London because there you expected everything to be the same and the little differences were magnified. But Betty Ann Smith, who gave the course, used to draw a little graph and the graph went up and that's where you arrive and you say, well, it's not as bad as I thought it might be and it's not as hot and the house isn't as terrible as I thought it would be. So I can sort of live with it. And then you, the graph goes along like this, and then all of a sudden the graph goes down because you wake up one morning and you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean these people are always gonna speak a foreign language, and the water's never going to run 24 hours a day, and it's always going to be this hot, and that's where people get, have a bit of trouble, and then eventually it kind of inches its way up again. Um, and also, if you move too many times, you start to remember only the good times. So when you go to a new post, you think, oh, this is terrible, because you've only remembered the good things from the last one. My problem was always finding toilets in a new, in a new post. Um, when we were in Ethiopia, and I'll just interject that when we were in Ethiopia, um, we were heading for a place in, in the country and we just had a lot of coffee in the morning and it was a big mistake. And we went out to open a project somewhere and we didn't have my, my husband's driver, we had somebody else. Our, my husband's driver, if I said, Abraha, could you stop for me? He always found a place with a tree and a running brook and he made sure there were no puff adders or anything. And, and maybe a picnic table or something, but this was Gadamu, and Gadamu, when I said, could you please stop, he just pulled over and he stopped. <laughs> and Ethiopia has no uh, vegetation when, when it's under drought conditions, so there was nothing, absolutely nothing. But amazingly, there were a set of tall rocks, and if you talk to Ethiopians from Addis, they know this area. And I thought, this is fantastic. So I grabbed my umbrella because I always take an umbrella with me in these circumstances, a big golf one, because you can twirl it, you know, if people are coming, you can twirl it. <laughs> and rushed out, and I was sort of three minutes into my performance when I could hear this funny noise. And I looked up, and it was the train from Djibouti going by. <laughs> and, and it goes very slowly, and it's very <laughs> And I was on the right of way. That's why there was nothing there. I was on the right of way. And anyway, I made my way back to the car, and I could see the driver was going to laugh, and John didn't dare say a word. And, and we went on with our trip. And the next day was the 4th of July in, in, um, at the American Embassy, and I... Was a, and a priest came up to me, the, the number two in the Vatican Embassy, and he was an American priest, and he often talked to me about problems he had, and he said, Lena, I need to talk to you. And I said, sure, Donald, what's up? You know, can I help? And he said, well, I was on the train from Djibouti. <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't, actually. He just, he just heard it because everybody had told him about it. <laughs> you know, so you get to a new country, and I'm sure a lot of you have done that, but even the groceries are different. The first time I went to buy snow peas in England, and I kept saying snow peas, you know, Chinese peas, snow peas, and a woman near me kept saying manj tu, manj tu, and I didn't know whether she was saying eat me, eat me, or what. <laughs> and finally, somebody said, you, you, it's a, you eat the whole thing. That's why it's manj tu. So I got that. Then when we got to, um, well, other countries, eggplant, you know, maybe as aubergine, but in South Africa, it's brinjal, which is a, a Malay word. Um, tangerines are satsumas in England or, or thereabouts. They're narchis in South Africa. So, um, so that's a bit of an adjustment sometimes. You don't recognize what, what you're shopping for. We also had in Nigeria um, 
two big catalogs that we ordered from, from Europe, and most missions do, and they were dense, dense, dense uh, printed, and you had to be very careful when you ordered. You ordered everything. Suzanne Courtemash, her ruler must have slipped or something when she was getting the right name because she was ordering escargot shells. And for some reason or other, she didn't realize that there were 20 in every box. And so she ordered, you know, a, a case, a meaning to order just enough for one dinner party. So we all had escargot shells that we had to buy from her. But there were times when the meat came from uh, Kenya and if you ordered three small roast beefs, like five pound roast beefs, you would get, you know, 15 pounds of meat and then you were left in your kitchen tying it up and sort of butchering it and everything. And then if there was a, a power outage, you had to suddenly run with all your roast beefs into somebody else's place that had, that had a freezer that was still working. So I don't mean to make too much of it. I'm not whining. It was a great life, but it was unusual sometimes. Um, you had to be very careful about getting ill because in many of the places that we served, which were chiefly in Africa, um, you were medevaced if you were really sick, if, you, if, if the situation warranted it. And my husband got typhoid um, twice. And so if he ever woke up in the middle of the night and said, is your stomach upset? Then I always did the mathematics. I think, okay, the flight, for, the medevac flight from South Africa will take three hours, and then we need an hour to get the paperwork done to get to the airport. And is this stomach ache worth worthwhile? Do I have to get worried? Because um, it wasn't just a matter of getting yourself on 911 and down to the hospital. Um, and of course, you lost your support network. And you, you know, your children never grew up with their cousins or their aunts and uncles. It was all gone. Ultimately, your children left. When our kids first went away, um, we were allowed a quick phone call. I think every Sunday they paid for I don't really remember the details. But then, you know, you get, when your daughter calls up and says, I'm moving in with my boyfriend, it's just, it, you know, you can't say I forbid it or tell me more because the time's up. Um, in the old days, John was allowed five minutes, um, a five minute phone call on a Sunday if he was away for more than two weeks. So he would call, and the whole conversation was, how was the trip? Fine. How's the conference? Terrific. How are the kids? Fabulous. I think the time's up, but I haven't told you that the washing machine broke down. Mm -hmm. you know, so there was always mm -hmm. real stress. And he once called me, and he said, um, um, I'm going, oh, I, he said, we're going to the Australians for, for cocktails, and then we're going to the French for dinner. And then I suppose we'll wind up, you know, and there I was with three children under four. And he, he said, he made the mistake of saying, how's it going? And we had a son who had a stomach problem when he was little. And so he was always throwing up. And I said, I don't know about you, but if Peter throws up once more, I'm throwing him against the fireplace. <laughs> and our time is up. Goodbye. <laughs> and just, you know, the, sometimes it was not so good. Um, it was the wife, the spouse, always went into the home. The, the, the officer always went into an air-conditioned office, had a great deal of respect, and spoke Canadian English with most people, whereas we were in, a, in a, the home that they, that they allot you, um, speaking with people who may not have English as a first language. And in, in many African countries, the languages are tone languages. So you really, it's very difficult to learn. And f for example, our, um, I said to a, one of our staff in the house once um, that my husband would be late for lunch. I said, he's, he's coming all the way from Somania. And Alex the steward said, Somania. And I said, yeah, you know, Somania. And he said, I don't know Somania. And I said, well, you come from Somania, Alex. <laughs> and he said, no, madame. I come from Somania. <laughs> a huge difference. It worked the opposite when we had come back from Nigeria where every, um, every syllable is pronounced as it, as it is in many, um, in many languages. And we got lost on the way to someone's house and I said, I'm so sorry that we're so late, but we just couldn't find our, we, we got stuck around Penaglen. And, and they said, Penaglen. And I said, yeah, you know, on the Queensway, Penaglen. And they said, Pine Glen? 
<laughs> it worked both ways. <laughs> you got to a post and you had you had servants, yes, and you had eight hours a day to fill and you didn't know anybody. And suddenly, you know, you had you weren't cleaning the bathrooms, you weren't doing any of the things that you normally filled your eight days, your eight hours a day with. And uh, suddenly you had to find something else to do. If you didn't work, I don't know what women did when they didn't have work or as, or as Francis did, went back to university because it, it was a, they were long days. People always thought you were rich. It certainly wasn't true. We had a dentist that, you know, she'd get all the equipment in my mouth and then she would say, Elena, I have diamonds so cheap. <laughs> And we just, we couldn't afford any of those things. We are civil servants, and, and we get a civil servant salary. So we call it mink to sink. Um, you know, the, the luxury life and then the ordinary life. But we have the most incredible experiences, and, and you wouldn't want to change that for anything in the world. Um, I, you know, we were in Buckingham Palace on a number of occasions, and we were presented to Princess Diana and Prince, uh, Prince Philip and everything, and I always try and fit that into a conversation glibly when I'm here, you know, but it just never, it doesn't seem to present itself, you know, <laughs> someone, someone says I'm busy and I can't say, well, I was really busy the day I went to San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> but she was, I, I should tell you though, she was lovely. We were all, we were in, in big rooms, but they divide you up so that you think that it's very intimate. And so we were in the music room, and she came around, and for some reason or other, she stopped right in front of me. I, I think it's because I'd had a terrible haircut and I didn't get a new dress. I had an ancient dress out. And she said, is your husband going to ask you to dance when this, when this reception is over? And I said, well, I hope so. And she said, well, that's really nice because mine won't. You know, I've got to go upstairs after this. And I thought, you're complaining to me. And my husband, who's very tall, was just desperate to say, I will dance with <laughs> But off she went. <laughs> we do have big houses, it's true, but we pay for them. And I want to make that really clear because we are charged what's called a rent share. And what the government has done is to peg our, our uh, rent right to what it would cost if you lived in Ottawa. So they, they do surveys and it's, it's according to what your salary is because they assume that at that salary, at that rank, you would be paying this much, and that's what we pay the government. So it's all done very fairly. And who pays for the servants? Who pays for the servants? Mm -hmm. um, when you're a junior officer, you pay for them, but they re but it's a uh, 60-40. You pay 60%, and the government pays 40 because they are supposed to be there so that you can entertain. At least that's mm -hmm. what it was in our time. Now that no one's entertaining, mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But we pay for them. When you're ambassador, the government pays for them. And it's very hard to fire them, too, mm -hmm. when, when you're an ambassador because they're government, by then they're government mm -hmm. um, employees, yeah. yeah. Which servants are, are the source of most of the conversations that take place in homes mm -hmm. on postings. And you find that the husbands never come home, that the wives don't say, do you know what she did today? You just won't believe it because <laughs> we're not accustomed to having that. You know, it's a completely different culture for us, and I, when we got to Nigeria, and I was 23, and I said, I'm not going to be like all those other madams. I'm going to be egalitarian. I, they are going to be part of the family. And, and so I said to Grace, the nanny, um, now, when it's time for your three hour break, you take your break. Wherever you are, I want you, don't, don't worry about extending your hours. You just, you know, I was so benevolent. Well, the first time that happened, I had a, a ladies' lunch, and Grace walked into the living room and lay down on the only couch that we had. <laughs> so there had been a little bit of a misunderstanding. <laughs> she tried to drown our daughter twice, once in the swimming pool and once in the, once in the bathtub. So we got Alice, um, and Alice was absolutely lovely, but Alice augmented her salary with gentlemen callers in the evening so it, it caused her <laughs> she kept saying they're my cousins but they all visited after one o'clock in the morning in Ethiopia um, do you know Ethiopia at all? Yeah a little bit. Yeah. In Ethiopia we had Kadir who um, was addicted to chat. Um, chat is a is a, a, a euphoric stimulant mm -hmm. that you chew and and you often see people with their mouths. Yeah. 
you store it somewhere. They store it here, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, but the train from Djibouti, where a lot of it came from, arrived in Addis uh, right after lunch. So Petir was always really anxious to to get going so that he could chew his chat for the afternoon. And then in the afternoon he was kind of useless because that was <laughs> that was sort of post chat. Um, in Zimbabwe, we inherited a cook who for his, called Pius, for his maiden meal, where you'd think he'd want to impress, he served two pork chops and a, um, a potato with no butter, no parsley, no salt, no pepper, and a, and a bit of carrot. And after the meal, because I, I thought, oh goodness, this man's going to have to put on dinners for 20 all the time. Is he going to be able to cope? And I said, Pius, you know, have you ever thought a bit, a bit of, about garnish? And he said, what is a garnish? And I said, well, you know, a little bit of parsley or something like that, maybe. I guess it was lamb, because I said maybe a little bit of rosemary or something. So the next day, when the ice cream came, we had a big thing of parsley. <laughs> <laughs> he was replaced by Tori. Tori was about six foot four, I guess, and really, really thin. And, and he was a fabulous cook. And one night when we had a big dinner with senior government people, um, just as John was about to make his little remarks, Tori suddenly came into the kitchen, uh, into the lit dining room, and stood next to John. And he had his huge chef's hat on, so he was really a presence, and he had very long arms. And he said, I want to thank you all for coming to dinner this evening. I have used nothing but the finest of ingredients, and I hope you've enjoyed the meal. And we hope you will return with these arms just going. We hope he was like a windmill. We hope you will return again. And then he went back into the kitchen. So um, we still stay in touch with most of them. And we, the cook that started out in, in Ethiopia saying, I don't come for breakfast and I don't come for lunch and I need a car and driver to bring me here, was my best friend. And, and we still, we, I phone them all the time and they phone me and they send coffee when they can. But the best, I will tell you the best um, story of that, I think, was told by the, um, the, the German ambassador in Ethiopia. And she had been the wife, she had been the spouse because she and her husband traded places one post after another. Sometimes she went as ambassador and he went as spouse and the other way around. And on, on the last occasion, he was, he was the ambassador and she was the spouse. And she began by saying to her staff, I don't know how my predecessor did it, but I would like you to set the table this way and the, put the candles out this way and this is, this is how I do things. And one thing that's very important is between courses, I want one of you to go around and just check the cutlery because it could be that people have used the wrong piece of cutlery and you want to replace it. So uh, she had noticed that, that in between courses, nobody ever seemed to know that the, that the that course had ended. No one ever came out of the kitchen. So she said to her husband, would you arrange for just a little bell under my foot so that when everyone's finished eating, I can step on the bell, they'll hear it in the kitchen, and then they'll come and take the plates away. And she was busy and didn't test the bell. And on the day of the party, she stepped on the bell and they had installed something like a fire alarm. You know, the thing just went <laughs> like this. And almost simultaneously, there was a crash in the kitchen. And then there was silence. Everybody sat and waited. And then a steward came in and walked around and he removed the soup spoon from everybody's place. <laughs> that was what had hit the floor. So. <laughs> Our friends were almost all from the, from the, uh, population from the, they were. All, we always made friends among the local people rather than the diplomats. That we thought that was why we were there. Um, we wanted to integrate fully, and we were very lucky because um, my husband had gone to school in West Africa, and, and we felt very comfortable with our postings. We went to Pretoria, much to our amazement, because because of our attachment, particularly to West Africa, we couldn't believe they were sending us to Pretoria while apartheid was still um, on, the, on the law books. But in fact, it was, it was a fabulous time, and I was hired to uh, run what was called the Dialogue Fund. It was over a million dollars a year, and the Treasury Board 
in the first time ever passed a ruling that we could uh, find a project and we could make out a check up to $50,000 within 24 hours and all at the post without going back to Ottawa. Um, I, I stayed in one of the black townships as soon as we got there, and uh, which a lot of white South Africans kept saying it's illegal, it's illegal, but it hadn't been illegal for quite a few years, but um, they just didn't know that. And had a wonderful time. And the, one of the, then the project that I dealt with that took me there uh, was a, a group called Quinonia. And I went to see the, the man who ran it. And I said, what exactly do you do at Quinonia? And he said, well, we bring blacks and whites together to eat. And I said, yeah, OK, but, but what, it, what, what do you do? And he said, we bring blacks and whites together to eat. And I said, no, no I, I hear you. but. I'm, but what are your programs? And he said, Elena, in South Africa, that is a program. Blacks and whites do not eat together in South Africa. And so it's something that we organize, and it, and it takes a long time. Um, we were there still while there were uh, black and white bathrooms. When we were in the Eastern Transvaal, I jumped out of the car once with my proclivity and ran to the bathroom and heard a man screaming behind me at a, at a gas station. No, 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 that's not your bathroom. I mean, it was that, it was that delineated. The children um, were in school there in, in uh, South African schools, and every story always began with, Mom, I'm going to tell you a story, promise you won't cry, because the stories were just absolutely heart-wrenching. At that time, blacks were, got off the sidewalk if whites came down the sidewalk. Um, I remember a friend of mine saying, if I go into a greengrocer and I say I'll have those nice tomatoes, the greengrocer will say, are you kidding me? You'll get the tomatoes from down here and you'll be grateful. A friend of mine took her dry cleaning into uh, a dry cleaning shop and they were her gardening clothes. And the person at the desk said, are these black clothes or white clothes? Because they went in different. Well, the white clothes went in clean chemicals. The black clothes went in the chemicals after the white clothes had been through. It was shocking. I mean, to, to us it was shocking. One of our friends was assassinated. One of our friends had their son in solitary confinement. And I used to visit the only woman on death row uh, in Pretoria Central Prison. And she was there along with her husband um, because she, they had been in a group that had stoned to death a, a black policeman. And she was just standing there, but they had a law on the, on the books that was um, the law of common purpose. And so if you were just in a group and you were rounded up, you were considered to be uh, having part, taken part in that activity. Um, we were very lucky because uh, with the Dialogue Fund, um, we were, a, and, and being with an embassy, we were able to invite people of all races to our home without any problems at all. And so we had a lot of those parties. And one night we were, I don't know if the name Richard Goldstone means anything to anyone, but Richard Goldstone ran the Goldstone Commission, which, which unlocked apartheid, essentially. Uh, there had been a, a commission by uh, Mr. Justice Harams, and it had been a whitewash. And they named uh, Richard Goldstone to the next commission. And I phoned him when he was coming to Ottawa, to, um, and I said, can we have a dinner in your honor? And he said, I'd like that. And I said, could we invite a member of the ANC to the dinner? And he said, I have to think about that. Just give me a few days. And he called back and he said, I've thought about it. Because you know, the whites had been told that the ANC had horns and that they were dangerous and that they were communist and that they were going to pull the country down. Um, and so we put him next to a woman that we knew would be quite beguiling politically, and it, he said it was the first time that he had ever realized that there was another version to, to the story. And from that, he was more open. He began to hear the ANC stories or the, or the other stories, and he uncovered all the dirty tricks that we knew were going on, but that the government claimed they didn't know were going on. So it was a very special time. But then in 94, John became ambassador. and. I'm, I tend to polarize people. People either like me or can't stand me. And suddenly, when John was ambassador, everybody liked me. <laughs> I was wonderful. I was so funny. I was so interesting. I was so intellectual. Everybody wanted to be my friend. 
And that takes a bit of getting used to, too. And I, I sort of, I boned up on my Nancy Reagan skills. You know, when John spoke, I would lick my lips and I would look up at him adoringly and, and sat through all his, all his speeches. Um, we were lucky and we went to Accra first, West Africa, that's Ghana, where John had been at university. And before we went, I, I burst into tears when he came home and told me. And I said, all your old girlfriends are still there. And then I thought to myself, wait a minute. Those women are in their 50s now. I don't have to think about this. And uh, I mentioned it to a Ghanaian friend of ours. And she said, Elena, Ghanaian women don't get older. We get better. <laughs> so off we went. And, and by then, a lot of his friends and classmates at the university from the University of Ghana were cabinet ministers. So it was really a very... Um, it was a, a great time for us. I taught at the international school. I taught writing. I taught creative writing uh, to 180 uh, students. And again, we had a lot of political dinners because even there, there had been some friction. So bringing people together at a diplomatic table works very well because everyone's on their best behavior. And you can invite people that have diametrically opposed philosophies or even backgrounds. And they will get along. And so it, it very often does help. Um, I noticed um, soon after we got there that I was the only woman at the table talking all the time. And all the other wives never said a word. And then I discovered that the wives were really incredibly talented and had wonderful jobs. But when the men were there, culturally, they were not encouraged to say very much. So I, I realized that the, you know, the Canadian government pays for all the entertaining, and they weren't, the Canadian taxpayer was not getting their money's worth. So we changed. John would invite principals, and I invited women. And, and those were the best meals of all, because women are much more apt to network. And you know if someone was working on an AIDS project, and somebody else had a tangential uh, role in that, they would immediately get together afterwards. And so. We, we filled in all the gaps in that way. Um, we moved, uh, Christine Stewart, did, I, did I, you know her when she was Minister of Health? She came to visit us and, um, you know, ambassadors tend to call themselves Excellency, you know, and, and very often you're introduced and they say, oh, Your Excellency, may I introduce His Excellency to you and His Excellency's wife, Her Excellency, Your Excellency? And, and I said to her, oh, it's just the stupidest system I've ever heard. I can't imagine. And she said, oh, Elena, I know that you probably use it. And I said, no, I don't. I don't. I don't. She said, I bet when you get into bed at night, you say, oh, excellency. And I said, I do not. I say, ecstasy, ecstasy. And she went home and told people I was very unusual ambassadorial wife. We moved to Ethiopia for the next um, four years. Ethiopia, I don't know if any of you know it. It's a, just a beautiful country, and if you haven't visited, you should. Um, it's mo it is actually half, probably half Muslim, half Christian, and and they believe that the Ark of the Covenant is still there. It's the oldest Christian kingdom, and there are some amazing things to see uh, if you go. But it's a very very poor country, um, and now this week I heard on the BBC that that they're in the grips of another terrible drought. There are many, many, um, many beggars. There. there were when we were there, many beggars in the street with, that were maimed, you know. But um, it, it, it was it was very difficult to be there. And somebody call, and you become quite. I don't know if you'll agree with me, but you become a little inured to that level of poverty after a while because I think if you saw it with your conscious mind, you couldn't live with it. So a friend of mine said, oh, the most awful thing. She said, I took a whole back seat full of bread for the beggars today. And she said, I came home with it all because I passed one and he was only missing a hand. And then I passed another one and he was only limping. And she said, Elena, I'm ashamed of myself. But nobody looked deserving because we've seen so many terrible cases. You know, So in your mind, you develop these gradations of poverty. I think maybe like walking down Princess Street. You know, we uh, people often say 
well, he's smoking, so I'm not going to give him any money, and he's got tattoos, so I'm not going to give him any money, without recognizing the fact that the, that the need is the same. So, um, but I worked there for international NGOs and for the United Nations, um, and that was and that was a fascinating, uh, you know, fascinating insight into how things work. Um, we had a dinner. We always the tables were 18 to 20. Um, Mr. Harper wanted to have. In fact, if he had stayed in power any longer, he would have had tables for eight. Uh, with, which would really have been a shame because a table for 18 or 20 is really a conference table once you get going. And we always used it. We felt that we had to use it really well to either put people together or to, to find out more about the politics of the place. Um, but very often the thing just didn't work. You could just sense that the dinner wasn't working. And one night we had 18 people around the table and so John said, I'm going to go around the table and eat, ask each one of you to tell us what your organization does. They were all from NGOs and they had non-governmental organizations and they had some incredible programs. Um, but one man who was really tiny and could barely see over the table went on and on and on about his NGO and we thought it was very small. We thought they only had one thing going on but they had all kinds of things. And I was so gobsmacked that I leaned across the table and I said, well, you must be incredibly well endowed. <laughs> <laughs> and there was just a silence and I thought, oh. <laughs> and I thought, I just, I can't laugh because if I do, you know, I just look like such a dirty old lady. And luckily the man next to me just couldn't couldn't hold it back and he started to laugh and it, and it kind of enlivened the thing. Another, at another occasion when in a diplomatic, um, before a diplomatic party all the names, the, the guest names are slotted into a big leather board and so what you're supposed to do as you walk in is sort of glance at the board and see who's going to be on your left and see who's going to be on your right and that, see where your seat is and everything. And um, on one occasion John was having a big lunch and somebody, it's, it's quite common for people just not to show up because very, in some places the feeling is I did you the courtesy, you did me the courtesy of an invitation, I have done you the courtesy of a response but it doesn't mean that I'm coming. So at the last minute there were people missing and John said can you just step in and, and sit at the dinner. I know it was some trade dinner or something. And in the middle of the dinner the steward came and said phone call for Mr. Mohammed." And I said, well, who is he? And he said, I don't know. Phone call for Mr. Mohammed. So I said, well, bring me, the, bring me the table board so I can see. And I looked at the table board like this. And I said, what, what's his name again? And Kadir said, it's Mr. Mohammed. And finally, I realized he was the guy right here <laughs> who was sitting next to me. And I had just made, obviously, such a fuss and didn't know his name. And it was, he said, I think you must mean me. But, you know, you can get yourself into these positions. I used to tell my husband that I thought Paris under certain circumstances could also be fairly pleasant, but we always asked for posts in Africa, and we went to Harare um, as our last post. And um, I worked for UN organizations and international NGOs. I don't know whether you know what's happened in Harare, but um, since I think 02, uh, Mr. Mugabe, the president, has introduced um, laws and, and changed things so that the country spiral from being the breadbasket of Southern Africa to being the, the basket case. Um, and when we were there, you actually took what they called bricks of money, like you carried a backpack, and nobody could stand there and count the money because the, the value of the money had gone down so much. You ended up buying People told me that they were paying for a loaf of bread what the same amount that they had paid for their homes 15 years earlier. They were th it would cost thousands, and so you would carry your money on a, in a backpack, and then they would weigh it at the at the uh, cash. Mm -hmm. And you saw terrible things. You know, mothers obviously so thin with babies on their backs, wandering around the supermarkets trying to find what they could afford, which was sometimes a tin of coke and a bag of chips and that was all they were eating and, 
And I, I was in a bakery once when a little schoolboy went up to the front and you could just see he had his money and the, he wanted to buy a bread roll and the lady said, your money is not enough. And so then he was just looking to see what he could afford to buy and, and he could buy nothing. He, he had to, well actually I, I, I just waved and, and she gave him his bread roll, but he would have walked out of the store without anything. And what year was that? Was this basic? We left in 05. Yeah. We were there from 02 to 05. Yeah. Um, security was, was quite poor then because um, a lot of people were, were hungry and, and they had nothing to lose. Um, and uh, it was really too... You're not from there, are you? No. Okay. It was really two solitudes when we were there. And what the blacks said was, sure, we don't have official apartheid. But what happens is that when, when we start going to white people's restaurants, they invariably start moving the restaurants further out of town, you know, so that they're not as accessible to us. Nobody says anything, but it's just there. And I think I only once saw a meaningful interaction between the races, and there was a white girl sitting in a restaurant, very attractive girl, obviously waiting for someone who was late. And a black girl came in, and the white girl jumped up and yelled, you are late. And I thought, oh, we're going to have a scene here. I just know it. And then she threw her arms around the girl, and they embraced, and they laughed. And it was a normal Canadian anything sort of a conversation. But it didn't happen in Zimbabwe, We, at least not when we were there. And we had Christmas parties, for instance, where we had 200 people. Everybody came. And whites would say to us, how do you get our black uh, fellow countrymen here? That's just amazing. And the question was, how do you not? And they would often say, well, you know, we're very good friends. Somebody once said to me, you know, that girl is a very good friend of ours. And I said to the and, and white woman, speaking of a black lady, and I said um, to her, I hear you're very good friends with these people. And she said, really? Did she say she'd ever had me to her home? Has she ever invited my children to her children's birthday party? Has she ever greeted me in a, in a grocery store? I don't think we're friends. So it was that sort of a disconnect um, all the time. And I don't know whether it'll get better or not. Certainly there are eruptions there now. So I think on balance I was able to find the me and the we. Um, I certainly had the richest life I could ever have had, uh, the most fun, and um, I have no complaints. Did you children have an adjustment culturally to coming back to Canada? Coming back to Canada? Yes, and the, the, when we came back from the Philippines, one of Elizabeth's friends said to her, could you just shut up about all this Philippine stuff? You know, nobody cares. It was hard on them, yeah. Because my sister's in Peru, before that they were in um, Colombia. And she was always chasing the maids out of the room, saying, let them clean their own room. They yes. have to go home eventually, and they'll be doing it themselves. Yes. And she said, the kids there are like princelings. She said, they are catered to and spoiled. And she said, she didn't even like them. Yeah. And she said, I don't want my kids growing up like that. So it's kind of like, you know, how do they, you adjust back to looking after yourself? Yeah, you well, they did. Thank goodness. Yeah. yeah. But you're absolutely right, because you say to the staff, I want my children to make the beds every morning. And they say, oh, madame, no, they're just children. Yes. Yeah, yeah. no, you, you can't get away from that. Mm. Um, yeah, anybody? Did they go to boarding school eventually, your children, or were they always with you? They were always with us because we sent them home and they went to university. And they, Elizabeth came straight, came to Queen's, yeah. Because yeah. I understand that a lot of people in your situation do that, send their kids to boarding school. Yeah. You, and you can. The government will pay for you to send them to boarding school if you're in a place that warrants it. I mean, you can't go to London and, and say, I want you to pay for my child to be in a boarding school. But, um, but they will. And we were very lucky because the international school is always so expensive, they were really happy that we chose the cheaper alternative of the local school. Uh, they all spoke English. They were all English medium schools. So, yeah. I have a few things to ask the children quite clear in what you were saying first. You say you're a diplomat. What's the difference between the diplomatic post and the embassy, you know, the ambassador? You know, were, are you giving clear 
you know, rules as to what you're supposed to do when you're part of the embassy, or you just, because you said when you, the embassy called you or the ambassador and said prepare dinner, you know, so and so. As if you didn't, you know, as an ambassador or a diplomat, you didn't quite know what, you know, your rules are or you could refuse it. You know, you said after a while, you start refusing. So I'm not quite clear in your speech. What's the difference between being a diplomat or, you know, or the ambassador if you're given special rules to any candidate? The second thing, just have to the same time, is I don't, you know, confuse someone else. When you go there, the Canadian government is a free Canadian, you know, we are um, diplomat you know, a democratic country, well, are you supposed to just entertain, you know, the whites or the foreign people? Yes, yes, when you were in South Africa, I didn't go to South Africa until after apartheid. But what I'm just trying to say, you gave me the impression that, you know, as a Canadian representative, you, you were still supposed to be just with the, you know, the white, you know, the people who were in government. Were you supposed to not interact with maybe what was going on other than... Absolutely. You know, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, to answer your first question, we got a little handbook that outlined what you were supposed to do initially. I don't, I, I'm sure that they're embarrassed about the handbook now. I don't think it exists any anymore because now there are no such rules, but it was just made very clear. And when you were very young, when you started, um, you just watched the people that were a little bit ahead of you and saw what they did, and so you did that. And it was very hierarchical. Um, you know, everybody knew who everybody was, and, um, and so you, you have behaved accordingly. But yes, that's how it was then. Um, in South Africa, no, in every post we invited anybody, we, we could invite anyone. We could have a, a, a cultural evening and invite cultural people. Provide the, the underlying uh, philosophy was always, how does this help Canada, and how does this help Canada stroke whatever country relations? So you could invite anybody. Um, and we focused mainly on the political. So we had, I mean, in those countries, we had blacks, whites, coloreds, which in South Africa was a, 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 an official description. Um, and we invited people from all political groups simultaneously because we felt that the idea was that they should get to talk to each other in a safe place. And that was our home. So as a diplomat, how many diplomats are attached to an embassy? For example, as it yes, sir. it will be different numbers depend. Like London had, I think, three hundred or something. Something but, like that. Yeah, and but but other posts will have ten. I mean, there's some. The, I always wanted to go to to uh, New Zealand, but apparently, I think it was one man or one person, a secretary, and in those days, a fax machine, because we get along so well with New Zealand. We don't need a lot of diplomats there. But different numbers depending on if they had a big aid program. If they have an immigration program, Paris has an immigration program, Kenya has an immigration program. So then you have a huge number of immigration diplomats. Yeah. And is your work outlined? I'm still still confused. Is your work outlined as what a diplomat should do? You know, as against what the ambassador should do as a dip because oh, okay. a diplomat you're just working for the embassy. Yeah. Well, yes. You're yes. distinguishing between the junior diplomat yes. and the mm -hmm. senior the ambassador, right. Um you know, it's not really outlined. I think you just... You just really do... You just have to pray you're doing the right thing, yeah. I mean, the person who is the officer, man or woman, he has been trained in the office, in the Pearson building, yeah. and he knows what he's doing, and hopefully he's married somebody or living with somebody who, who knows what you're doing. Who can follow what is expected. There are a lot of wives that... There, there are a lot of unhappy marriages because, you know, you marry a, a school teacher and he tries, and, that, and that's what, you're, what you focused on, you're, and that's what you think your life will be. And then he writes the Foreign Service exam, or she writes the Foreign Service exam, and the next thing you know, you're sitting overseas, and that wasn't what you wanted. Um, and, and nowadays, of course, we had to go along. My husband's wedding ring says, Whither thou goest. Um, we had to go along. There was no question that you would go on your own. But nowadays, the spouses will say, "I'm a doctor, and there's no job for me, so I'll see you when you're on holiday, or I'll come. I'll come sometimes, or I'm just not interested." In our, we didn't turn them down either. We had to say yes. Sorry, I'm intrigued about that couple that you said switched off. Yeah, they were German. Was, so when the man was in the spousal, as opposed to the um, ambassadorial position. 
Uh, was he expected to entertain? No. Mm -hmm. He wasn't. He was selling I arms, as a matter of fact. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he was, uh, yeah. I, I mean, he was doing government-sponsored work, sort of. I used question. to call it merchant of death, yeah. I've, Sorry. I've got a question. Well, it's not really a question. It was just when you mentioned the Queen, it brought back a couple of memories of, of mine when we were living in London. And that was that I was standing in front of the Buckingham Palace one day waiting for my driver to come and pick me up. And uh, the queen pulled up in her wagon and opened the door and said, come in. So I got in with her and she said, we'll go and have a cup of coffee. And we pulled around and over into her kitchen. And we sat down in the kitchen and we had a lovely cup of coffee and oh a nice chat. And then said farewell and off we went. Off I went. Oh my goodness, were you wearing gloves? <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> but she was very, very pleasant. Yeah. And, uh, Did she know who you were? Pardon? Did she know who you were? <laughs> Uh, well, she, if she didn't, I told her. <laughs> <laughs> but she must but have I seen had, your car and you I would have had... I had her many times before yeah, because I mean. she was the one that uh, gave permission to the attaché in Egypt to marry Louis and I mm -hmm. because there was no, nobody else there to marry us. So she gave her permission to them, so we were married in Egypt with the Queen's okay. And so then when we went to England, we met her many times. But, uh, that's not that's not part of your speech, and I thought Well, no, out. but I'm going to pretend it is now. It's <laughs> <laughs> now, Frances would have, her husband was the most senior diplomat in London. Yes. Because they, in London, they tend to put in uh, political appointments who are yeah. sort of figureheads. But Louis was really, essentially the ambassador in, in London yes. and then somebody, I don't remember who was, Roy but, McMurtry I think was. Yeah, McMurtry was yeah. very, very nice. He was very good. Yeah. And we Jameson. had a couple after that that weren't that great, but yeah. that, I mentioned those in my book, so. <laughs> yes, Florence has done a couple of books. <laughs> As have I. Sorry. Is there enough time? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, there isn't. Well, there's enough time after Okay. People want to stay. Yes. Um, Elena has brought some books. If anyone is interested in purchasing a book and having I should uh, just. How much would it be? It, it's they're twenty dollars. People and they they make hostess <laughs> gifts, but they're um, they're really meant for women of an age. They deal with like rogue chin hairs and. <laughs> May I read a passage? Yes. yes. Or, yes. Do. If anyone, if anyone else, else has a, have you got a question? So, but. No, anybody else? I wanted to know what happened to the woman on death row. Oh, she got out. Oh, okay. And I used to visit her, and she couldn't speak English. We had to, and you know, big, oh, it was just like in the movies. And she and her husband were both there, and they had tons of kids that were left, you know, in the care of neighbors. And she got out, and I got a phone call one night from the Black Sash, which is an, which was an anti-apartheid organization for ladies like ourselves, you know. Um, and they said, please come, Evelina wants to talk to you and I didn't even know she was out and she wanted to thank me for coming because she had no visitors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, she got out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Evelina de Brain was her name, yeah. Well maybe if we're gonna if we're gonna break here and some people have to leave, I'll just thank you officially so much for coming and sharing your stories with us. Oh you're very well thank you. Thank you. Thank you.